Well, good morning. Man, it is good to be back with y'all. I know you benefited and enjoyed hearing the word from Sean Edwards last week, and I'm so thankful for that brother and his heart for this church, his heart for the other churches of our community, and for the Lord in all the various ways that God has gifted him to serve. And so today we are starting a new sermon series through the book of First Peter and the idea of chosen exiles and what that looks like and how that's going to impact us and, and what that is going to mean for us as we live in this place that, that, that has this feeling of, of being home but of, of not quite being home. And, and, and how we push back against this feeling to, to make this place, this home, these relationships be more than God intended them to be. And so it's going to be about a six month or so study as we journey through this book together. Today we're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 1 through 2. If you want to open up your Bible to the book of 1 Peter, it is near the end of your Bible. So hit James and just go just a little bit further and you'll find it. If you're having trouble locating the book of 1 Peter, if you have a paper copy of God's Word, there's a table of contents at the front. If you have a digital copy, you can just tap your way there. It is near the end of the New Testament. And just know as we make our way through today, the large numbers are chapters and the small numbers are verses. We're going to be in a few other places as we track down some parallel passages, some Old Testament backgrounds to try and help us understand what Peter is saying. If you want to just mark those down and follow them up later, uh, that would be great. Or if you're really fast, you can turn there. Uh, but either way, we're going to spend the lion's share of our time in 1 Peter 1, uh, verses 1 and 2. Hey, let me read this passage for us to begin our time, and then I'll take us once more to the Lord in prayer. Peter writes and says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Let's pray. Father, this morning as we come into this place to study your word, and, and God, in some sense, really just to dedicate these next few months to internalizing what it means to be elect exiles, what it means to be chosen pilgrims, chosen sojourners, strangers and aliens in the land. God, that you would help to cultivate in us a sense of homesickness for a place we've never been. God, that you would help us to cultivate a longing to be faithful to you here in the middle of this land of antagonism, of opposition, of difficulty. So God, that we would be a people made in the image and the likeness of Jesus, being conformed to him, finding ourselves in submission to your will. God, that this would be such an incredibly profitable time for us that we would be able to look back in six months and just see the various ways that you have grown our faith as we've given ourselves to the careful study and application of your word. Father, we want to pray for the other churches of our community that they too would experience vibrant times in your word, that you would be changing hearts, that you would be restoring lives, that you would equip them and empower them to profoundly impact our community. God, we pray for their pastors, for their staffs. We pray for the laity that attend the various churches of our community. And God, that you would just do great and awesome things in those places. Father, we submit this time to you and ask that you would help us to focus now on your word, draw us closer to your heart, transform our lives as we encounter you by the power of your spirit. We ask these things in Christ's name. And they all said, amen. amen. Hey, let's, let's look at a little bit of background and kind of get some understanding of, of where we find ourselves. Maybe you're new to church and so you're, not really sure who this guy Peter is and what the big deal is with him. Peter is one of Christ's dozen or so followers that are in his inner circle. In fact, Peter is the first one to recognize, or at least verbally to recognize and be recorded in Scripture as having said that Jesus is the Messiah. He's the, the one that all of creation has longed for. He's the one that God had sent and purposed 
to redeem, to restore humanity. And then just on the heels of having said that, Jesus said, okay, you've got this. Flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven, all right, let's go to Jerusalem, and there I've got to suffer and die. And Peter's like, eh, eh. Like, I know who you are. I know better than you. And so Jesus has to correct Peter. Peter's the one uh, who, when Jesus is walking on the water, Peter jumps overboard and then gets distracted and starts to sing. Peter is the one that after Jesus is betrayed and handed over, he's there in this space. Peter chooses volitionally to deny Jesus three times. And Peter's the one restored by Jesus once for each of his three betrayals, once for each of his three denials. So Peter is such a great mirror for us of ourselves, of our weakness. Peter is such a great encouragement to us of God's transforming and equipping love and helping us to overcome the various sins, the various shortcomings that that evidence themselves over and over again in our lives. And so this letter is written by Peter. If you're to look at 1 Peter 5 and 13, He says, she who is it, Babylon, greets you. And so Babylon is likely a reference to Rome. It's a veiled reference to the city of Rome. And she is a reference to the church that Peter is writing from. And so likely Peter is writing uh, this letter to a group of churches from the city of Rome. And he's writing it probably around the years, sometime between 62 and 64 AD. So this gives us kind of a, a ballpark and an understanding of what's going on. So Christians at this time are having an increasing sense that, that they're different, that the way they live their lives, the way that people experience them, the way that things go for them in community, it just it's, it's different. There are things that they can't engage in. And so they feel themselves stuck in the middle of this. I, I live in this city, but I, I can't fully buy into all the things this city does. I can't fully buy into all the things that are common, appropriate, and acceptable in the culture. And because I can't do this, because I can't show up in these ways, because I can't celebrate some of the same things they're celebrating, it, it makes me look like an outcast. It makes me look different. And so they're struggling with how to be a Christian in these places, in these spheres of influence. Notice how Peter refers to himself. He says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ in verse one. So Peter sees himself as one who has been sent out by Jesus. He is a He is somebody who has been commissioned to go out. The commission originally given to Peter was a ministry uh, to to Jews. And so that's kind of the lion's share of Peter's ministry. But interestingly, as we work our way through the book of 1 Peter, one of the prevailing thoughts is that he's really writing and working and ministering to people of a pagan background. He's writing to people of a Gentile background. But he's doing so in such a way as to appropriate very Jewish language. And we're even going to see some of this here at the very beginning where he's talking about the dispersion. When we get into chapter 2, he says, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a people for his own possession. Once you were not a people, but now you are a people. And so he's taking very Jewish nomenclature, very Jewish terminology, and he's a applying it to a group of people who come from disparate backgrounds. They come from a wide variety of backgrounds, but he's helping them to find commonality. He's helping them to find their identity in the person of Jesus Christ. And so notice he says, I am an apostle. I'm one sent out by Jesus. I'm one sent out by the Messiah come from God. Now, who is this letter to? Geographically, the letter is to uh, these five churches in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, covering roughly 300,000 square miles. So it's a a little bit of a big area. It's a big backyard, right? So one of the thoughts is, much like in the letter that John wrote in Revelation, it's, it's an encyclical letter. And so the thought would be that the person would take the letter from Peter in Rome, he would travel to Pontus, and he would begin to kind of make his way back around, and then eventually ending back up in Bithynia, which is right beside Pontus. Now, most of these things, when we're thinking about kind of modern geography and and where they are, most of these places find their home, their location in modern-day Turkey. So if you think of, of, of this area and begin to think of kind of where these churches are and kind of how they're gathered around, they are a group of people who find themselves living in a variety of different cities, but all of these cities having very similar experiences 
because all of them are under Roman rule. And Christians are a decided minority and would stay a minority for a a great many years within these areas. So that's geographically who he's writing to, but let's look at how he refers to them. And this is what becomes so incredibly important. He says they are the elect exiles of the dispersion. Now, dispersion is really this idea of the diaspora. And and again, it's going back to a Jewish understanding. So within the Old Testament, the context, the people are there. God takes his people from Egypt. He moves them from Egypt into the promised land. And as they move into the promised land, one of the things he tells them as they cross over the Jordan is that if you are faithful to me, you will stay in this land. But but when you move in disobedience, I'm going to bring discipline upon you. And so they run through the time of the judges, they run through the time of the kings, and so you've got Solomon, you've got David, I'm sorry, you've got Saul, you've got David, you've got Solomon, and then it splits under Solomon's son, Rehoboam. The kingdom splits, and so you've got the northern kingdom, and then you've got the rest of Israel. And in the split, we begin to see Israel really move in a more rebellious direction. Ultimately, we see the same thing in Judah moving in a rebellious direction, So what does God do? God sends a group of people to take his people, Israel, into exile. So ultimately, go into exile in Babylon. Not Rome, Babylon, but Babylon before it was hip to call it Rome. And so they go there, and then when they return, they're placed in a variety of different locations. And this is where we get the idea of the diaspora. You didn't know you were showing up for a history lesson, but there you go. I was out a week, and I came back with all this fancy book learning. (laughs) Got it in New Orleans. Go figure. And so they're they're there, they're in this dispersion, so they're in these various areas, but now their dispersion, now their diaspora isn't merely geographical, it's cultural. They are placed in all these various settings, but they are dislocated from the place that they are made to be. They are dislocated from being with God, and they have this sense of what this feels like in their very being, to their very core. They just feel constantly out of place. And in this sense of being dislocated and in this sense of being out of place, he refers to them as elect exiles. Now, the idea of election, the idea of being chosen is something that is weaved all through Scripture. And so let's look at just a couple of places. I want us to see it first of of when, in some sense, their election began. And so if you want to look there or write it down, you can reference it later. In Ephesians 1, 4, and 5, Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus, and he says, speaking of God, he says, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. To the purpose of his will. If you were to look back in verse 3, or rather verse 4, it says, look, notice what he said there. He says, before the foundation of the world. So it is in the providence, it is in the mind of God, it is in the purpose of God to choose a people for himself before even the act of creation began. Now, this is incredibly instructive and helpful for us. This is so incredibly important that we wrap our minds around this understanding. There's this false understanding that God creates Adam and Eve, they're in the garden, that everything's perfect, and that somehow God has left something on his grocery list of of creation, and what he's forgotten to check off is the uh, ability that he's entrusted to Adam and Eve to sin. And so Adam and Eve sin, he's like, Dad, come on, I left it on the list. Ah, now what am I gonna do? Oh, he's twiddling his mighty heavenly thumbs, stirring up the cosmos, doing this, and he's like, ah, I know what I'll do. I'll send the second person to the Trinity in the fullness of time, he's gonna die on a cross, and whoo, Oh, that's so, I'm so glad. I'm so glad I was able to fix this. No, what the scripture tells us is that before all of these things began, before he spoke the word, before he created all things from no things, he purposed in his heart to send Jesus in the fullness of time. And he purposed in his heart to choose for himself a people and to choose for himself you. Your salvation is not an accident. 
Your salvation was planned and purposed and determined in the heart of God before anything ever came into existence. And this allows us to rest and trust in his grace and in his mercy. And so our salvation isn't ultimately determined about how well we're doing or how poorly we're doing. Our salvation rests and trusts in a God who himself is good and holy and righteous. Amen? Amen. Now look at what he goes on. Let's, let's kind of stick with this idea. So we are elect. We're chosen by God. It's in the providence of God. It's in the planning of God. It's in the prevision of God to call us into salvation. Speaking to the same language of what it is to be an exile, of what it is to be an alien, of what it is to be a sojourner, we find it all the way back in Genesis. Genesis 23 in verse 4, Abraham is trying to find a place to bury his wife Sarah. And so he's, in, he's surrounded by Hittites, and this is how he describes himself. He says, I am a sojourner and a foreigner among you. Give me property among you for a burying place that I may bury my dead out of my sight. So he recognizes, listen, I don't have any rights. I don't have any property. I am in this place, and I am passing through. His understanding in this place was that he's passing through. That's the identity that God gives us as his people. Paul, writing to the church in Philippi, <laughs> wrote it this way. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20, he said, But our citizenship is in, everybody say, heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. And from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. The author of Hebrews, and, and, and again, kind of describing what it is to be a people who find themselves dislocated, a people who find themselves out of time, a people who find themselves being somewhere that they don't recognize, wrote these words in Hebrews 11, verses 13 through 16. Speaking of from Abel through Abraham, he says, these all died in faith not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. So this great list of the heroes of the faith, he said they found themselves, they saw themselves as strangers and aliens on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone, they would have had the opportunity to return. So they're not thinking of Egypt. They're not thinking of some place they've previously been. They can't go back there. He says, but as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. God has prepared for you. He has prepared for me. He has prepared for his people a homeland, and he has emplaced in our hearts. He has woven into our DNA. He has made in our lungs. He has created in our breath a longing that exiles, recognizing this is not our home. He has chosen you and destined you and, and, and purposed for you to head to a place You've never been. You are a chosen exile. And this is our identity. And this is the reality that we experience. And so when you go to work, whether you're working, uh, uh, you know, you're, you're preparing to work at Blue Oval, you're working at a restaurant here in town, you're selling insurance, you're working up on Fort Knox or whatever it is you're doing, you're a retiree. And so you're bouncing back between here and Florida, depending on which weather is better. And sometimes you just don't know, right? So you're stuck in the middle. In all of the various places you might be at any time you might be there, what you carry in your identity and you carry in your person is the reality that what God has created you to be is a person in whom his grace rests and a person who is not home until he takes us to be with him. You are a chosen exile. God has lavished his love upon you and he has created you in you a longing that can never be satisfied in the here and now. So everywhere you go, in every place he carries you, there is an opportunity to speak as one who is an ambassador for a homeland you've never been to. This past week, I was in New Orleans for the Southern Baptist Convention, which if you don't know what that is, it's imagine going to a large family reunion where there's a little bit of animosity for most people, for everybody else, and now you're understanding what that's like but we all have to work together to eat the potluck that some of us are pretty sure that others have poisoned, right? 
not poisoned on purpose. We've just know that there are eggs and mayonnaise and we've left it out overnight at room temperature. We don't want them to die. We just want them to be very, very sick in an embarrassing way. Nevertheless, and so I'm there and I'm walking along with a friend of mine uh, who's been a mentor of mine for a number of years and he is a raging Alabama fan, which is super disgusting, right? And so we're, we're in New Orleans, and so one of the things that you see when you're in New Orleans, because it's relative proximity to Baton Rouge, is people with LSU garb, which is also equally disgusting. But as we, as we walk along, there, we went to this restaurant, and we're walking out, and there are these two guys sitting on a bench with LSU gear on, and he walks over to him, and he says, roll tide. Because he carries in his being at all times this understanding that he is a rabid Alabama fan. And it doesn't matter how big or how small or how angry or how happy the people he's engaging are, because he carries in his identity at all times the fact that he is an, an, an obnoxious Alabama fan. You and I should carry in our identity at all times the fact that we are chosen Exiles that God has purpose for us to be different in our engagement. But so often what we find ourselves doing is seeking to make this place where God currently has us be heaven. We're trying to make this place heaven and the insanity of that, it would be like moving into an extended stay hotel and then uh, we just say, ah, you know what we need in this extended stay hotel is better furniture and so we, we run over to the furniture store and we load it up and we bring it back and we're taking out the bed and we're putting in our own bed and we're taking out the chairs and we're bringing in our own chairs and we're like, what this place needs is some art on the wall. And so we go to an art gallery. We've never been, but we know art's what fancy people do and so we want some. And so we go and we find some art and so there's a picture of Sammy Hagar There's some Vincent Van Gogh. There's some Rembrandt, right? We're just trying to keep it real. We're just trying to mix it up a little bit. And then we say, ah, you know what this place really needs is a flat screen TV on the wall. It's got one, but it's not mine. So we take it down. We take it to the front desk and we put ours up there. And so we're in this extended stay hotel with all this stuff we've gathered around. But every day we recognize this is not our home. This is an extended stay hotel. We're paying an, an exorbitant fee to stay in this place, and we've created this false reality of comfort, but the reminder from everyone coming and going is telling us over and over again, this is not my home. The refrain that needs to echo again over and over in our hearts is this is not our home, because when we live under the reality that this is not our home, it creates an urgency in us for the people around us, And it gives us endurance to run the race well. And the race must be run well. Because look at how he goes on. He said, all these things have happened according to the foreknowledge of God. God has planned it. God has laid it out. And this is what's going to happen in you because of the foreknowledge of God. The first thing is this idea, he says, it is in the sanctification of the Spirit It's in the sanctification of the Spirit. So the idea is that the Spirit of God is making you and has made you to be holy. Now, this may be a foreign concept for you. So holiness is an attribute of God. He is holy, other. He is set apart and distinctly different. God is morally perfect. And in salvation, so in this moment when you came to know God through Jesus, the blood of Jesus has saved you. You have believed on the sacrificial death of Jesus in your place. Jesus who came and lived a perfectly sinless life, who died, who was crucified upon a Roman cross, who entered into the grave, and then God raised him up from the dead. That in this, you have believed that his death stood for you, all of your sin upon Jesus, all of your liability on his perfection, and all of his perfection in your place. So when God looks towards you, he looks towards you through the blood of Jesus, the sacrifice of Jesus. So when God sees you, he sees you as holy. He says it's the sanctification of the spirit. So you became holy at the moment you were saved by Jesus. And over the course of your life, this idea of sanctification is repeatedly working in you and repeatedly creating in you a hunger for holiness and a hatred of sin. And it's progressive. 
It's over and over again over the course of your life. So there are some of us who find ourselves engaging in the same kinds of sins over and over again. And over the course of our life, what the Holy Spirit is doing is giving us a hatred for sin and a love for God and a love for his holiness. So in the foreknowledge of God, he's working his sanctification to save us and to hold us fast in the middle of this thing. For what purpose? Why are we made holy? Why are we growing into the reality of this holiness? He says it's two things. He says it is for obedience to Jesus and for the sprinkling with his blood. It's for obedience to Jesus and for sprinkling with his blood. So the idea of obedience, again, goes back to an Old Testament idea. Now, we we get obedience in terms of it's doing the right things at the right times in the right ways, but there's this Old Testament idea found in the book of Exodus where Moses is speaking to them and he reads all the words of the law and he's communicating to them. And the people, when they hear this, when they hear the the rules of it, they say, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Again, in verse seven in chapter 24, it says, and the book of the covenant uh, was read and in the hearing of the people, and they all said that, that all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And we will be, everybody say, obedient. We will be obedient. So everything we know of God, everything we read of God, we're going to do our level best to follow through on. So on the basis of this testimony and this commitment to obedience, what Moses does next signifies a sealing with God. It says, and Moses took the blood and threw it on the people and said, behold, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these Words. And so Moses is, is guiding them in this understanding that it is, it is this atoning sacrifice that is covering you and that is keeping you there. Now, within the Old Testament context, they're doing this with, with bulls, they're doing this with goats. And so it's this constant reminder that it requires sacrifice to keep me in relationship with God. It requires sacrifice to cover my sin. It requires sacrifice to cover up the fact that I'm a a lying, cheating, adulterer at heart, that I have trouble with anger, that I have trouble with, you know, whatever thing. And so just going on and on and on. I I doubt the reality of God. I doubt his promises. I am lazy. I'm a glutton. So whatever issues that are going on within their lives, they have this reminder that it requires a sacrifice to keep me in relationship with God. It requires a sacrifice to keep me in relationship with God. But the difference is in the coming of Christ, there's a sacrifice once and for all, for all sins. So it's not this repeated reminder of, oh yeah, I sinned, I've got to go into this, and, and then I've got to be covered by the, by the blood of the bull, I've got to be covered by the blood of the, of the goat, I've got to be covered by this sacrifice. It is this reminder that when we as Christians sin, and we all sin. We do. And we all, Paul says in Romans, we all fall short of the glory of God. And we're going to find ourselves doing this in such a way that when we sin, there's this call in our flesh and this call in the God of this age, Satan, to keep us in our sin and to keep us from living in the reality of being a chosen exile. Cause us to live, to, to live in the reality of our sin and the consequence of it instead of living in the reality of our forgiveness. And so this is why Paul, or this is why Peter, rather, in the middle of this, do you notice what he's doing? He's pairing obedience with sacrifice. So when we come to this understanding that, that it's under the foreknowledge of God, it's under the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. Or sprinkling with his blood. There was a constant reminder for the people of God that they needed a sacrifice to keep them in right relationship with God. There was no way around it in the Old Testament. But somehow, deceptively, somehow, insidiously, the enemy has worked into the mind of too many of us the understanding that when we fail to be obedient, we fail to persist in the love of God. When we fail to be obedient, either in omitting something, there's a sin of omission, we're not doing the right thing, there's a sin of commission, we are doing the wrong thing. 
So there are ways we sin in our minds, there are ways we sin with our actions, with our bodies. That when we do these things, the enemy, what he's communicating to us is the reality of our sin is who we are and how we are operating. And that's our real identity. That God is a sham, that he doesn't really love us, that we're not really close to him, that if we were close to him, we wouldn't have these things in our lives. But do you notice what Peter does? He says, God has made you holy. He is moving you towards holiness. And he's done this so that you would be obedient. And when you're not, the blood of Jesus still cleanses. It's the sprinkling with his blood. All the people gathered there in Exodus 24, all that the Lord has said we will do. And they didn't. And he took them into exile, and in his grace, he brought them back. And in his grace, he restored them. And in his grace, he sent his son, Jesus. And in his grace, he lavished upon them forgiveness. All that the Lord says we will do, that is the heart God has given us in sanctification. But the flesh which clings to us, and the sin that we are surrounded by living as a sojourner, as an alien, as an, and as an exile in enemy territory, keeps clinging to what we are. And so we need to live and we need to repurpose and we need to continue to remind ourselves that what is being applied to us in these moments of rebellion is not our guilt, but it is the blood of Jesus. First John 1 John 1.7 says it this way, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we will have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Y'all, the beautiful thing about that is when John uses the word cleanses there, he's not talking about a once and done occurrence or a once and done application. It's this idea that he uses in the construct of the language there. It's this continual idea. So when you find yourself and you're engaged in lying, you're engaged in lust, you're engaged in in cheating, you're, you're engaged in some form of malicious anger. And you find yourself in the middle of this and you acutely recognize or you're confronted that I'm not walking in obedience. What happens in that is the blood of Jesus comes back in and it cleanses you once again, restoring you back to the reality that never left you, even as your awareness of it passed away. You are a chosen exile. You are precious and loved by your heavenly father. And his blood covers you, cleanses you, continually keeping you near his heart. This is what he's created us to be. And what Peter recognizes is that for us to stay in this reality, for us to live in this place of dislocation, for us to to live in some sense in this extended stay hotel, surrounded by other sojourners, surrounded by other aliens, surrounded by a group of people who are hostile to our very presence and our very way of life. What is necessary for us is not primarily greater diligence, but it is the grace and the peace that he asks to be multiplied to us. He says, may the grace and peace be multiplied to you. My prayer for us over the next six months is that God's grace and peace would be so multiplied to us to give us the ability to increasingly walk in the reality that he has created us to be and placed us here as chosen exiles.